Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you about today is architecture and uh, try to address a gap that I've noticed and don't quite understand on the missing of a distant seeing of architecture. Uh, we talk, of course, a lot about digital art history, which is fascinating on its own grounds, but no one ever talks really about a massive reading of architecture. Uh, that's what I modestly try to fill. My playground is the city of Venice. Uh, and before going into what uh, I've been doing, I'd like to present to you, like in all good plays, the characters they are, um, what I play here in this research project. There we go. The main protagonist is what you see here. Um, it's a 3D model of the city, which was obtained through aerial imagery, uh, combined them into um, a photogrammetric model. This was conducted uh, in collaboration with the Superintendenza dei Beni Architecturali, uh, government office in Venice, as well as a Parisian company specialized in aerial imagery. If we zoom in a bit, uh, this is what it looks like. And you can already see, I think, the most precious quality there is in this model. It's, it's homogeneity, meaning that for once, we've got a way of looking at the city, not so much through the lens of grand uh, churches, grand palaces, which are, of course, fascinating in their own right, but giving equal importance to the anonymous fabric which actually comprises, well, 98% of this image. So uh, what I like to do is cutting things up. So what I've been doing is using the footprints of the city, which you see overlapped here. Uh, basically, every building has a geometry. And then use that to simply cut the model. This is what it looks like for one of those modest, relatively modest, um, palazzetti, so small palace in the center, and you can isolate it and start to play with it, visualize it a bit. Uh, if we zoom in a bit, this is what it looks like. Uh, of course, now since this is aerial imagery, we don't have the interior, we just got the exterior. Um, but it's quite useful in its own right, again. Uh, so what I do is cut this, every building, into facades and start to look at them. Uh, simple geometric operation. What we need now is a way to have a Norm representation of facades, something that does not depend on the context, uh, on how close it is to other facades. Uh, and the solution for this is what is called in cultural heritage an autophoto. Uh, you've seen one in the previous presentation, this is another one. Basically, it's an artificial photograph uh, of your points of interest into a perfect 2D plane um, with no sense of depth. Now, this is a big assumption, but it's it's, uh, are you completely valid in the case of a flat architecture like, like most of Venice? How do we do this? No technical details, uh, but basically we take the big point cloud, we take the footprints, we cut it out, we simplify it a bit, we uh, separate all the facades, and then we get rid of the third dimension, depth, which we don't need through principal component analysis, basically going from a three-dimensional representation to a two-dimensional one. And in the end, what you get is the autophoto that we so much desire. Okay, so those are all 8,567 buildings of Venice. This is very white, I apologize for that. But we can add a bit of color. Uh, and what I mean by that is perhaps add extra information. Uh, what you see here is purely visual. It comes from a, so to speak, dumb aerial scanning, uh, but we can attach information on dates, styles, um, historical content, whatever. Uh, so we start, like all good things, by looking at Wikipedia. But it's a bit disappointing. Um, what you see here, or rather what you can guess here, are the buildings that have been geometrically matched between our current day Venice uh, and Wikipedia. And it's about 300. Not so bad, most cities would like that, but um, in the case of Venice, there's a huge bias you can guess that it mostly covers churches, um, palaces, palaces um, and eventually big um, public, public uh, buildings. But there's a big, of course, uh, bias in the geographical distribution. So what I've been considering doing is adding other more specialized literature. And this comes in the form of architecture catalogs. 
Um, Venice is, of course, incredibly dense with a strong um, historiographic tradition. And many catalogues exist of historians describing buildings, positioning them, explaining their architects, dates, style, whatever. So I've taken one of them as an example um, by Giuseppe Piamonte, Venezia Vista dell'Acqua, so a Venice seen from its waters, uh, extracting the text through optical character recognition, extracting ingress, matching the two, and this is what it looks like. So it's a much better, much more homo homogen uh, coverage, but it's still 1% of the buildings, 10% perhaps. Um, let's move back in time a bit. Because all, all you've seen up till now holds true for 2023. Uh, but we can, we can do better. We can go into the 18th century, and this is what you see here. Venetians have been, of course, very good at keeping a strong administrative surveying of their own city. They started in the Middle Ages. Uh, this kept true up until roughly Napoleon. Uh, what you see here is the latest of those proto cadastres So it's a, a systematic surveying of the population of Venice, uh, including information on who owns the place, who rents the place, what's the cost, what's the use. Every door. Um, it wasn't geoma geoma well, geographically positioned, and we did this, therefore getting a, a very meaningful surveying of the city at the state, and like no one, no one has seen it before. Another protagonist in our story uh, is this. Well, this is uh, the brainchild of Napoleon, if I can say. Early 19th century, uh, Napoleon en enters the city and starts a campaign of surveying the first proper geometrical, geographical surveying of the city. Basically the same, but this time with the shape um, of the building. You can see roughly the 50 sheets uh, collaged, put together here. And what we've done, like we've shown you in the past presentation, is automatically vectorize this, uh, which couldn't be done by hand, of course. There are too many polygons. This is what it looks like. Uh, again, roughly all 7,000 polygons have been automatically extracted and assigned a label based on their usage. Um, what you see in pink are buildings, uh, in green gardens, and in uh, gray are roads and, and squares. Okay, so I think we've got our list of, of people now. Um, let's put them all together, shall we? And this is what you see here. We've built an interface. I'm not gonna go into detail um, on that, but to see how well interact the point cloud with the photos, the cadaster, the external databases, et cetera. I've also added historical um, archival photographs. But part two of this presentation is how we play with all that, because it's good fun, but let's, let's make sense. Uh, very naively, we can start by looking at the easy and, and, and fun answers, which is what are the largest eight buildings in Venice, and what do they look like? This is what you see here. According to Wikipedia, we compute the area, we place them together, uh, nice and simple. Not that much a surprise, but of course, the big churches take uh, one, two, three, four uh, of the top spots, two Renaissance public buildings occupy the two, and then two big 20th century projects, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century projects. But we can do a bit more. Um, I've talked to you about the importance of using autophotos, um, and this is not just for convenience, it's because they allow a form of abstraction uh, so that we can start thinking of things not so much in terms of geography, but in terms of abstract comparisons. This is what you see here. Uh, all of the facades on the Grand Canal, the great um, river that divides the city and which has always been the theater of opulence, so to speak, and I've ordered them by height. So it goes from the, the small four, I've only shown four, um, Imbarcaderi, which are those water platforms on which the boats uh, stop, all the way up to the grand 17th century Baroque powerhouses. And you can see a great diversity of shape, which is a bit difficult to visualize at first when there is so much mix and match in the position. You might recognize the Rialto at the bottom, uh, which stands out. Okay, let's keep exploring. Let's keep watching facades. Um, we can do that also on geographical spaces. Uh, if we take, for example, the Fondamental de Canaraggio, which is one of those streets that borders a canal, 
um, you can see that very importantly it goes from the grand family um, centers, the grand palaces, you see them on the bottom right, the bottom left, to the small workers slash fishermen uh, houses at the top left, top right. Um, again, let's keep playing with different places and, and squares around the city and we can see that there is something in the height distribution that tells us a lot. Um, let me check the time. Perfect. Um, okay, so that was how we play between the, the footprints, the geographical information, and the point cloud. Uh, we order things by height, we look at facades, etc. I've mentioned the early 19th century cadaster um, because what it lacks, I mean, it's got geographical information, but we don't know what the places look like. Uh, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? So what we can do at very minimal cost is taking the information stored in the cadaster, uh, for example, list all the properties owned by the Grimani family, which one was one of the greatest patrician families of Venice, one of the wealthiest, and show me what they look like today. Those are the facades you see, and interestingly, though not surprisingly, it goes from the grand palace that hosts the family to smaller um, ownerships to all the way to uh, uh, entrepot, um, store, storage places. So it was really an economic uh, powerhouse again. Height, it's all about height, so we can map that. Um, and this is what you see here. If you take all the squares, streets, etc., of the city and compute the average height, let's start with this, um, you start to have a landscape of the city which tells a lot. For example, you probably uh, saw immediately the big red thing in the center, uh, which is Piazza San Marco, of course, with this huge campanile. Um, um, similarly, just a bit above, um, there is the, uh, the square of Santi Giovanni Paolo, uh, which has a huge uh, 14th century church. It looks like this. Um, and you can see that the church uh, really is a big landmark on the, on the square. It's, it's much higher than everything else. I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but there are a bit mysteries, and this is where the cross combination of information comes into play. There's this small area which I've uh, squared, which does not contain a church, which does, does not contain a, a palace, uh, but still is quite on the upper scale of the, of the height map. Uh, what is it? Well, it's, it's the, the ghetto. Um, so the Jewish quarter of Venice, which was for a long time um, not subject to height regulations which were otherwise taking place in the rest of the city. Therefore, because of geographic constraints, um, Theory th says that it was built above and above and above, up until reaching that great um, height, which are unusual. It's a great sight to see. Okay. Now what about not considering just one height for each square, but looking at how different they are? And this is what is mapped here. Uh, what you see is the standard deviation of heights for each of the squares, streets, etc. In red, again, is the the Piazza San Marco, and of course the Campanile is so tall that it, it, it flows the calculation a bit. But there are other places of interest where, for example, um, here, it's extremely low. Why is it so low? Well, the cadastro tells us something interesting. Um, it wasn't there in 1808. It's a new addition. Um, it was actually built by the Australian, oh, Austrians in the 19th century, uh, a form of social housing, plan housing. We can take a look at what it looks like, and indeed, no surprise, it's very coherent. Basically, the same module was applied again and again and again. Um, copied and pasted architecture, so to speak. Okay, so I've, I've shown you a bit before those signature of each, of each square, and you see that it holds, of course, the facades that have been unfolded. Uh, it also shows you at the bottom the skyline. Can you see the colors? No, you can't, okay, but you can guess them. Um, you should have seen the, the presence of a blue um, marker which shows the church, green being for uh, public, uh, private houses, and red being for openings. And all of that combined gives you a signature of what a square is about. Uh, if we look, for example, at two other examples, again, without the colors, but you can imagine, 
we can start to see different typologies. At the bottom, you've got Campo San Paolo, which is the largest square in Venice, uh, therefore a huge uh, symbolic importance. Surprisingly, the church, and it's probably one of the only examples, is the smallest building on the square, uh, as opposed to the grand uh, palaces that make up the center of attention in which you can guess. You can also see that there's no high coherence. It's really here and there, and then someone decides to build a thing, and no, no coherence on the height. It's exactly the opposite for Piazza San Marco, which is the proper symbolic center of the city, um, where everything was roughly built on the same height, uh, aligning on the same modular composition, et cetera, et cetera. There's a bit of a problem here. On the um, Procuratia Nuove, you can see there's a small um, increase in height. Well, that's unplanned, actually, because the architect planned to have it, of course, aligned with the rest, and then uh, his pupil, who completed the uh, Vincenzo Scamozzi, who completed the, 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 build, the building, decided to add an extra, uh, an extra level. It's a bit of a shame, but you get the idea of coherent spaces. And now we move on to the more exploratory parts of this research, um, which is, okay, we, we, we've looked at facade heights, we've looked at uh, how they distribute, how they are coherent or not, but we haven't looked at the facades themselves yet, and this is where it comes in. Um, I've taken four random facades on one of the squares of Venice, Campo Santa Margherita, um, and what we can do is go from this to that. That is, abstract their own um, composition, uh, what is known in, in architectural studies as forometry. Um, forometry. That is, the position of windows and doors. And it's extremely telling on the usage, on the, um, the style, therefore the time period, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what my thesis does, partly, is trying to test hypotheses that have been proposed uh, to sort of categorize and make up typologies of uses based on those compositions. And this is what I look like. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, so we can test our hypothesis. Uh, here's the example you've seen just before, and it matches quite nicely with the um, the category proposed by this architectural historian in the 60s, Paolo Maretto. Of course, the question becomes now, to what extent does this hold true for the whole of the city? He couldn't have seen it all. Can we somehow check, point the strengths and weaknesses of his approach by looking at every facade of the whole city? But there's a bit more, and I'll end on this. Um, the whole discourse on, on height shows that there is, of course, a double reading to every facade in Venice, the first one being very practical, what is the, the distribution of, of um, rooms inside, etc. The other one is much more symbolic. Um, there's this grand metaphor which ought to be questioned on Venice being a stage, Venice being a theater, etc., etc. Hence my um, cunning usage of Act One and Act Two for the names of the sections. But how much is this true? Um, is it true that a facade really is, before everything else, uh, um, a, co um, a consequence of what it looks like, what it's got on this side? This is what I've tried to illustrate here. Um, is everything ought to be seen not just as facades separate, but rather as a network of interconnected, um, so to speak, dialectical relationships between what has been there and what's being built? I've illustrated this on the Piazza San Marco, which most of you know, um, whereas there's the double discourse of what the facade looks at and what its neighbors are. And I'll conclude on this. Thank you very much. <laughs>